The following program is brought to you by the Baker and Baker Foundation and is a production of the Columbia Museum of Art. Hi, and welcome to the More Than Rhythm podcast. I'm Dr. Brigitta Johnson, host and ethnomusicologist. So we're back. Episode two of the More Than Rhythm podcast, the Black music series here at the CMA. Today, we're just going to have a little chit chat about jazz and how we see it. I know when I think about jazz, I uh, think about its global impact, definitely. As a scholar, I always think about jazz as being this wonderful invention that comes around in the late 19th century. This is an amalgamation of African-American folk, secular and sacred dramas are coming together, mixing with Euro-American folk and military band music. And even when you think about the New Orleans mix, you have music coming from the French and Spanish and Native American traditions. All these things I think about as a scholar educator. But really, when we get beyond that, as just a person, I remember jazz always just kind of being in the background. I think I talked about in the last podcast, growing up and listening to my mom in the morning get up with WLK, the gospel station. But the other station that used to play gospel sometimes was WCLK. So that was in Atlanta and it was actually a jazz network. And he would bring the biggest stars in jazz to Atlanta and they would be on the radio and they would be talking about their careers. And for me, as a young person, jazz didn't seem like this faraway genre. It was just something that was a part of the mix and it was just always there. Growing up in the 80s, you would hear quiet storm and they would put jazz instrumentals in there they'll put some smooth jazz in there so jazz kind of was just in this ether wasn't this something that you saw when you looked at lincoln center it was really a part of the musical mix of my background Mimi Jones is a bassist, vocalist, producer, label owner, educator, and filmmaker, and has reigned supreme as a sidewoman to an impressive array of musicians and as a leader with three original recording projects on her own hot tone music label. Jones studied music at the Manhattan School of Music Conservatory and has also studied with Linda McKnight, Lyle Atkinson, Barry Harris, Milt Hinton, Dr. Billy Taylor, and the legendary Youssef Latif. She is also a professor at the Berklee School of Music in Boston and has toured extensively over 25 years throughout the six continents and has played with spectacular artists like Frank Ocean, Kenny Barron, Dee Dee Bridgewater, Diane Reeves, Tia Fuller, Roy Hargrove, Terry Lynn Carrington, Beyonce, Jason Moran, and many, many more. Voted number one and number two rising star by the Downbeat Magazine polls for three consecutive years, she is currently working on a new project called The Black Madonna. And she's actually joining us today live via Zoom. So we'll be having a good conversation and getting into talking about black music, the influence of jazz in America and around the world. So welcome, Mimi. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm so looking forward to the concert and being with you guys in person. First of all, I just have to acknowledge what you said. Yes, Mm -hmm. I am a professor. I'm very proud to be a professor, but you know, Sometimes we forget that the music was really just a part of our barbecue parties. Yeah. Sunday yep, yep. afternoons, cleaning up. Yes, cleaning up to jazz. Yes. Yeah, yeah, listening to some Nancy Wilson, some Gene Ammons. You always had to have, like, I call it organ jazz, but Dr. Mm-hmm. Lonnie Smith. Lonnie Smith, yep. Mm-hmm. Exactly. And as a kid, I kind of didn't appreciate it as much. It was something my parents always played. They had to have Miles Davis going on. Yes. Like that was kind of blue was like their jam. It was like anthem. It's the anthem. Yeah. (laughs) And so, you know, just thinking back to those times and how I was a little bit rebellious as a kid, as far as the music thing, because I was into Michael Jackson so much. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, I think Michael mm -hmm. Jackson is like the Pied Piper. He has, even in this era. Look, ask the weekend. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Okay. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And so 
I wanted to do that. I wanted to do pop. I was checking out Earth, Wind and Fire, you mm-hmm. know, all of the, the soul and that kind of thing. So it was always good stuff being played around. But I came into the jazz basically in high school. But I actually got in on guitar, playing classical mm. guitar. Because my father told me if I learned how to play classically, he would talk to Michael Jackson and we would work that out. So I got to the school and I was switched on in cello because there wasn't a teacher there. Mm. And I I was used to my really great, great teacher. He was one of my first teachers, Mr. Jim Bartow at the Harlem School of the Arts. And it, it was funny, too, because he was accompanied by the brother of James Baldwin. Wow. So Mr. Baldwin and Jim Barto were my teachers and they had this vibe to them that was just, it was like of the sixties, you know, it's like just that powerful, very Afrocentric, but open because they were musicians. Right. Very inclusive. And they were a little bit hippie ish, but Mm -hmm. black Mm -hmm. hippie. That kind of like, gave me a vibe about sort of like angling to this really good soulful sound, Mm -hmm. but there are other things because Mm -hmm. my teacher, he played all the music of the day, but he was versed in classical music. Right. Mm -hmm. You know? And so I had to, I came in that way. I got to high school with the name and there was no teacher. They switched me off onto cello. And I was like, this is great, but this isn't the same thing. And then within half a year, I was fooling around with my friend's bass and that seemed very natural to me. Uh I was playing in a Barney Miller theme. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. Yes, yes. And then next thing you know, um, the band director, and he's still around today, he's still teaching Mr. Justin DeChocho. He did a whole, I believe a decade or so at Manhattan School of Music, but he was at the high school of music and art at that time. And he was like, we need a bass player. You play bass. We need you. And I was like, I don't really play. But He's like, you play enough. You know, the, you know, the theme song, the Barty Minor, you know enough. Exactly. <laughs> and from then it was just on and popping. Like then it came together. Why my parents were listening to this music. Mm-hmm. It was just like, this is so much fun. But like literally, if I stop playing, everybody looks at me. You know, I can't hide in the in the section. Right, like classical music. I was kind of like, if I mess up, the other bass, the other cellist has mm-hmm. it. This one is just one basis to a right. band. So I was like, this is kind of powerful. So right, like, okay, I'm gonna listen right. to this a little bit. Mm-hmm. And from then on, I began my journey in jazz, officially studying and taking different lessons. One of my first jazz-based teachers was Mr. Lyle Atkinson. And I started at the Jazzmobile School in Harlem. That's where all the jazz aficionados, when they weren't on tour, they came and ate. Wow. Okay. Yeah. That's awesome. And they were out there. So it was hardcore. It wasn't like, oh, sweetie. You know, yeah, no, it was like you gotta go practice those chords. You, be, you, you get your chops up, get your chops, get your chops. especially the 80s and 90s, TV and film were so jazz-centric. Sesame Street and The Muppet Show, jazz-heavy. We're talking about straight-ahead jazz. The number song, do 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 Oh, totally. That is the point of sisters jazzing up for numbers. We learned our numbers with the jazz song, right? Yeah. And then the Cosby Show, heavy jazz theme song, guests coming through to all kinds of jazz artists coming through that. And I remember this was also the era of Spike Lee films. And Spike oh, Lee yes. loves a good jazz film scores. How we think about jazz as this one little distilled museum thing is not really accurate to our experiences when we think about America. And then even in hip hop, I remember the 90s, there was a period where so much diversity in hip hop where you had 
the Guru Jasmine has series, as in he was a hip hop rapper, MC, who had multiple volumes of him pairing hip hop MCs with jazz players. I think the first single he put out was with the Donald Byrd piece. We were like watching MTV and BET and watching, oh, that, that's the guy who plays this. It's not a sample. That's the guy who actually plays the trumpet, right? And that series really brought hip hop and jazz together. I think about Diggable Planets. Cool yeah, like that. I'm really into it. Black Sheep. Exactly. How many bass players started because they heard cool like that, you know? Jazz has these different properties. How can I say? These different identities. It shows mm-hmm. up in different eras for different reasons. So like in the 60s or coming even a little later, I think I'm like Max Roach and Abby Lincoln mm-hmm, and, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and Nina Simone and how they were directly in the activism. Right. Freedom Now Sweet. Mm-hmm. You talk about Duke Ellington and, you know, there were Billy Eckstein, Milton Hinton. When you see those guys, they show up in suits. You see them on stage, the largest stages possible with the president or, mm-hmm. you know, in the, in the fanciest club. But in actuality, what I learned through my research is that they could not even attend those clubs. Did not go through the front door. They could not stay at the normal hotel, you know, after they go perform this large concert and then they have to go stay at people's houses. And so at that time, you know, they were just trying to make it through. Going down through the South was so dangerous for them, Mm -hmm. you know, and the way they traveled and the way they got food. They could not go to the restaurant. Could not go to the restaurant. They had to either get it out the back door or go to somebody's house. Exactly. Right. It's so incredible when we when we discuss this and like Lionel Hampton, his band, Mm -hmm. he dates back. I think that was the end of one of the major wars in Right. We see it like, oh yeah, you know, this is this is so cool. But they were in that. They were in that. Like just they were not respected as equal humans. They had to find ways to to make it to the next thing. They Mm -hmm. didn't complain. You know, because there was really no one to complain about. It was the law. And so just having you mention these different ways that the music shows up. Right now I am very inclusive. I run a jam session. I love when all races come. I think it's so important that the music stays open Mm -hmm. and I use it as a healing agent Mm -hmm. at a time like now where it's so unexpected in the last 20 years, what has gone down with us. It's like, okay, aren't we beyond that? Right. We're not. So for me, I, I'm, You know, I look at what the music was used for. I definitely am an activist in my own mind. Mm -hmm. I don't, I don't feel like I have done enough with it, but in my mind, you know, I feel like it is a way to communicate peace Mm -hmm. and Mm -hmm. wellness, Mm -hmm. you know, whether it's the wellness of a community, of a global world coming together. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Or an individual mind, you know, because we all know what mental illness is Mm -hmm. and we know that music definitely helps with that 100%. It also, for me, was a vehicle to save me, to give Mm -hmm. me something positive to do when all my peers were getting in trouble, Mm -hmm. you know, at that time, at the age of 14, most of my friends were pregnant. Was this 80s? Yeah. See, you. so you and I are from that 1980s. We're from that era of the so-called teen pregnancy when it was an actual national thing. And it was very, like you said, very common to have peers just like, well, they're not coming back because so-and-so is pregnant now. That was a very particular moment in America, particularly that decade, because it was one of those things where they were no longer sending girls off to some school and then they come back. They just sometimes never came back. Right. And so, yeah, that, that was definitely an era and music being that kind of, for many of us, that kind of thing to do to keep you out of trouble, keep you out of what was, was starting to explode in America. I think the other aspect of us growing up in the 80s and 90s is gospel jazz emerged. Yes. And so as opposed to people kind of saying, oh, I don't like jazz. Jazz is the devil's music. Angela Christie jumping right on in, you know, this jazz aesthetic 
it's not something that's off on the side. It always finds its way back into black music genres. And then, of course, goes back into these other popular genres. For some reason, the back of my brain was that Flip Fantastic. I think that that song, Beady Beady Bop, that came out in the 90s, it was like a jazz kind of hip hop song. It was on MTV. It was a top song. And people were like jamming to it and dancing to it. But that's a whole trumpet solo. It's a trumpet solo. <laughs> right. It was more trumpet solo than rap going on in that song, but it was big on MTV. And so this idea of just something sonically happening with jazz keeps bringing it back, but also the spirit of jazz, the openness that we keep coming to. I have to remind myself now because, you know, sometimes because I'm becoming an older musician <laughs> that the sound is changing. Because yeah. I'll listen to some, uh, you know, of the youngins and I'll be like, wow, like, that's not how it's done. And then mm-hmm. I'll think about it and I'm like, that might be the new sound right now because mm-hmm. they're experiencing pure chaos. It's very busy. Right. And it's I'm so like, much. Yeah. Give it some breath. But then I'm thinking like, this is what they're experiencing. Mm-hmm. I want to make sure I stay open to the change of things that are happening and not, you know, become like locked in. This is the way that it should be done because that's the difference between jazz and the classical music is that it is what the time is. Right, right. Go back and you learn the tradition so that you know how to do that right and it's a foundation, but it must keep evolving and breathing and the current time directly affects it. Museums should reflect the communities they are in. The CMA strives to achieve that goal not only in the art collected and shown, but also in its programs and presentations. And I can think of no better example than More Than Rhythm, a black music series. More Than Rhythm returns for the second season with a special performance from South Carolina native and globally recognized blues musician Adia Victoria. On break from her world tour, Victoria will take the stage with series host Dr. Brigida Johnson for a discussion about her journey as an eclectic 21st century blues artist, then return for a performance with guitarist Mason Hickman that will include some of Victoria's poetry, paired with dance interpretations by Columbia-based dancer Aaron Bailey. You can find more information about More Than Rhythm on our website, www.columbiamuseum.org. And now, back to the show. I saw you do on your PBS special a couple of years ago. You were talking about how a lot of the musicians, young musicians, their chops and their skills are so much higher because they're able to watch YouTube and take lessons. They get to hear everything and they get to practice and practice and practice. But also what you think about is your role into kind of going back around and going beyond just the chops and the technique, but going into like the history and how you see your role as making sure, great, you got your chops up but also painting that picture about where these sounds and techniques come from. Can you speak more about that? Mm. I, girl, I don't even remember some of the things. 2015. Yes, yes. I mean, it wasn't long, but you, yeah. You, it sounds like, you know, some of my teaching. So there's the intellect, you know, you, you must know your scales. Right. I'm an advocate for like, get in there and get your chops up. And chops is what we call facility. You yes. can play fast. You have the ability to recall 
very quickly. Phrasing is on point. Yeah. You have clarity in Mm -hmm. your execution of the instrument. I am totally for all of that at the highest level. But there has to be another reason that you are practicing to have that. Mm -hmm. And what I believe is that there is a message that comes through you. And so you want to be able to push that out to the public. Not every person walking around can just receive that. And so it's up to the musician to be able to bring that Mm -hmm. to the listener and have a deeper, more spiritual connection Mm -hmm. with the ether, the universe, religious, you know, whatever. Sometimes I'm on stage and I'm really nervous, but I'll start praying for somebody in the song or I'll dedicate the song to someone that I know Mm -hmm. that needs it. And it just calms everything out because now it's not about my ego and how I'm worried about how I'm showing up. Oh, maybe I didn't practice. Listen, you're up there now. You got here. You have a job to do. Mm There's a reason that you're here. It can't just be about the chops and that I can execute this perfectly. Okay, the next selection we're going to play is called Elevate. So we hope you enjoy. impression some people might have, you know, even listening today would be, well, jazz is not as dominant as it was in the 20th century, or there's so many things going on, jazz kind of gets either lost in the sauce or pushed off to the curb. Can you talk about the relevance of jazz today as we see it kind of continually popping up? And I'll just give you some examples of kind of primary memory. You think about Samara Joy, you know, this jazz vocalist who people keep seeing on TikTok. And she's coming up, and I think she was on the Today Show a couple of days ago, but she has this contralto voice, and she's just giving us this wonderful timbre and tone, and the young kids are loving it. It's like, oh my gosh. And of course, older people are like, this is the jazz I remember, right? And one more example. You remember when Esperanza Spalding, another bass player, upset the Grammys? I think it was 2011. Yeah, just and she, Bieber. Yeah. She, no, now, here's the thing. I went back and looked on it. In addition to all the Justin Bieber fans being upset because she won Best New Artist, she also beat Drake. Wow. She beat Justin Bieber, Drake, Florence and the Machine, and Mumford and Sons. All those were in that, that, that category that year, and she beat them all. And people were like, what do you mean? Who is this? Who is that? <laughs> exactly. And so she got put on the map. And then the next thing you know, she's playing for the Obamas at the White House and playing with Stevie. But that moment where when people are on one side of the mouth saying jazz is dead and you have this, this watershed moment where you have this young, also music educator in jazz. And so what do you think about this kind of you know, relevance of jazz today as we see these contrasting narratives around what jazz is doing, what it's not doing and, and how people talk about the future of jazz? Well, honestly, I don't think jazz is going to go anywhere. Mm-hmm. I, I mm-hmm. don't think it's going to die. Now, when you put a dollar sign to going out to jazz clubs Mm -hmm. and, you know, the struggle of people trying to get to festivals and what's the most popular music. Okay, so that's maybe a different conversation, but we can't it's 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 being proven now. We cannot predict what our youth is really going to appreciate because they will surprise us. Yes. There's there's an insurgence of young people listening to older music. And it's like, whoa, you like that? Barbershop Quartet is on the rise. X TikTok. Yeah. (laughs) You know what I'm saying? So it it definitely is a is a thing like a lot of things that goes around. I see it as a circulation, a reoccurring wave that comes through. Also, 
all throughout the world, people listen to jazz. Right. There, there was a point where I was questioning my career path, of course, because my parents, they, they loved the fact that I did music and they were like, okay, one is okay. One is doing it. The others, they have to go into, you know, education or whatever. Mm -hmm. But they were questioning, is this really what you want to do? And mm -hmm. so then that put it in my head, like, how am I going to get money from right. doing this? But it is a legit career all throughout the world. People love this music. People come together with this music in droves. Right. And so it's not going to die. It, um morphs, you know, and it takes on mm -hmm. other types of music. It integrates with other types of music. Right. Um, so when Esperanza came out, I was like, I really took a moment to like figure out her sound. And it took maybe about two years for me to realize, wait a minute, she has a Portuguese background, like a foundation. She's a black woman, but you know, her mom is that. Right, so right. she put that into mm -hmm. this music and it was such a fresh sound. But I think that's another gift of jazz. Sometimes it takes a while to listen because there's so many layers there. And I think to your point about it being a global sound, that's also what other people hear. They're used to listening to music longer. A lot of times in our pop culture, you're used to the two and a half minute song that doesn't even have an introduction. Like now when I play old hip hop for my students, they're like, when is it going to start? Because the introductions used to be a minute and a half, even on the hip hop song. You know, you got a whole bunch going on and then they eventually start rapping. But in the case of jazz, same thing where you can listen to something and really sit with it. I love Supreme. It's a meditation. You got to sit with it. And so I think what I love about young people getting into jazz now is that some of them are realizing, oh, I, I need to sit with this. This is going to require me to sit here and have a moment and a thought. And I don't just have to have a 20 second version of it or a 45 second version of it. I need to sit with this and we'll just vibe out with this. I kind of struggle with this particular part of the conversation because at this point, we're in the 21st century and, you know, things are coming along. We're being more open and more diverse. The role of women in jazz is getting better in some cases, but still some same challenges. So I, I wanted to ask you about how you see as a female bassist and vocalist and also filmmaker and activist. How do you see the role of women in jazz at this point? I know you're at Berkeley where you guys have the Jazz and Gender Justice Center. So what's your take on it? How do you feel about where women are in jazz today? You know, I feel like we are doing our best to move forward in a positive light. Myself, my views upon the Me Too situation, I'm, mm -hmm. as I'm really happy that this is a time where women can get up and say, that doesn't work for me. I don't have to take this. Why is my paycheck that and mm -hmm. this person mm -hmm. is not? We are able to say these things, but I do feel that it's still a lot of work to go. I don't see it. This as being a fad. I'm not an angry woman walking around. I have been violated by many situations in the patriarchal world, a society, but I want to educate what does work for me, not I'm just angry, you mm -hmm. know, and walking around ready to explode on you or get you fired. Mm -hmm. That is not my goal at all. I feel that we need the yin and the yang in life. We mm -hmm. can't exist with just one. You know, I definitely am an advocate for calling women. And at some point I was like, well, why do we have to still have a women in jazz festival. Can't we just play the whole year long? Like, aren't we to that? But we do still need the women in jazz festivals and attention to women because we still get lost in the sauce. Right. The platforms. Yep. We're still not 
completely understood. Women, by nature, Mm -hmm. we think ahead. What are we going to eat at the end of the week? We worry about these things that naturally come to us. Okay, am I, and, and I never had a child, but at a certain point, I was just like, okay, I have to have a child. How are we going to have a child? Oh my right. God. It How's just gonna naturally work? creeps up on you or dealing with women health, the things that happen to us on a monthly basis around our menstruation. No one talks about that. Or how my mom was trying to tell us, I am hot. And we used to tell her, Ma, be quiet. Uh, like, so, okay, open this is, now. This is going to unpack your actual work life. You're going to have to build these things around your work life and how you treat it and what you get on these jobs and why it's important to have this so-called equal pay because you need to consider all these other things as a woman. I look forward to the day where we don't have to point women out so much because they're just out there. And then and then on the flip side, I don't feel well when we put men down. Mm-hmm. I don't feel well when men are not revered as well mm-hmm. because there are a lot of men doing great things. And so it's important for me to not big women up and not big men up. I think we have to find a way that we we truly can respect both and both are celebrated as a whole in this world. Yes, we are still trying to figure this out. And I know I talk to a lot of my male friends, which are many because there are many more men in the scene and they some of them really feel like, well, I don't know how to approach you guys. But that's a cop out, though. So I think what you pointed out to and I think our young people are getting it because when we contextualize for them, these are those challenges of women in jazz. The young people say, oh, OK. And so you, now you see younger musicians standing up for women and say, no, dude, you shouldn't say that or you shouldn't do that or she doesn't like that. And it's not always on the onus of the female in that situation to speak up. Quincy Jones said that something off color one day and his daughters got him together. He came back and apologized. He said, no, my daughter sat with me and said, I shouldn't have been talking about that that way. And I think Robert Glasper had a moment where he was drinking in some interview. And he said a couple of comments that were kind of, you know, sexist. And people were like, no, this is unacceptable. You know, we, we love your music, but that's not how things are. And so you see this kind of shifting where beyond people getting upset about things and upset about what artists do and these behaviors, they're saying, no, this is how it should be. And it's now, I, I believe now it's more than just the women saying that. And so I think that the challenge for some men in these spaces is realizing you're going to have to do the work. We talked a couple of months ago. You, you said, I think part of my work is music. Part of it is uplift. And so we, when I talk about, particularly my classes with women, I'd say this is why I'm talking about this woman. Because no one talks about the fact that this person has the same status when we always talk about the guy in the situation or the guy, historical person. Excited to bring this particular project to South Carolina and uh, into the museum. It's called the Black Madonna Project. That name is so funny. I, I I don't feel like I'm necessarily the Black Madonna. It's an experience that I had when I was in the south of Italy. The promoter owned a restaurant and it was filled with all these different images of the Black Madonna. And I was oh like, my oh, gosh. I didn't know about this. He's like, yeah, it's it's like global. It's, it's a thing, everywhere. Yeah. It's a thing. And I was like, wow, she just looks so regal, so powerful at the same time. This is amazing. I sort of used that as a, an inspiration to some of this music that I created. And I feel like I found the right combination of musicians, which I am bringing a violist. And in some of my previous bands, I had never used strings. And now that sound with the strings from the guitar, the strings from the bass, really kind of come together in this vibrational way.
thank you so much for joining us today on the Binder Podcast, Mimi Jones. Yay, thank you guys. More Than Rhythm podcast is a production of the Columbia Museum of Art. Recording and editing by Drew Barron. Today's episode was hosted by Dr. Brigitta Johnson. Additional production for this series is brought to you by me, Wilson Bain. Today's guest was Mimi Jones, whose band, The Black Madonna, you heard throughout the episode. Funding for this series is made possible by the Baker and Baker Foundation. And this program has been made possible in part by the National Endowment for the Humanities. Democracy demands wisdom. <laughs>